John, thank you, praise team. What an awesome, awesome job they do, and they've done again and set the tone for the message tonight. Two years ago, I was preaching a revival at Mount Olivet United Methodist Church in Manio, the same church where Andy Griffith was a member. And after the last night of revival, I decided to head back home. It was Wednesday evening, and I was done. And I just wanted to get home, be with my family. My boys were with me, but the girls, Nicole and the girls, had already gone back home the day before for some appointments. And the pastor of the church tried to talk me out of leaving. He said, there's a snowstorm coming, don't leave. But I thought I could beat it. So I got a big mug of coffee. My boys were with me. I set them up with donuts and drinks and water, whatever they need. They got in the back seat. They got their movies ready. We were like, let's go. It's going to be 12, 1 o'clock at night getting home, but no problem. You know, I know what I'm doing. I know where, which way to go. No big deal. Well, five minutes into the trip, I realized it was a big deal. It was sleet, heavy snow, and my truck, if you've seen it outside, as big as it is, it began to skid and slide all over the place I couldn't see past five feet in front of me the only bad part is you would say why don't you pull over turn around and go back if you've ever been that way Dare County uh, it's a three mile long narrow bridge you can't turn back you can't turn around and the name of that bridge is Alligator River Bridge there's a reason why it got that name okay and the side, by the way, they're repairing that bridge. They're going to redo the whole bridge, the swing bridge. It is about this tall. So if you hit that side rail, you're going over. You're going into the water. It's cold, and I'm sure the alligators would love to meet us. And I'm so mad at myself. I'm so angry. Ever been that way? I mean, I'm so angry. Why did you do this? Why didn't you listen? You know, they set us up in a beautiful beach house. Uh, granted, it was in the wintertime, but it was a three-layer house, and they had stacked the fridge with food for us. Uh, there was a game room. There was TV channels, whatever you want. It was in there, and I was like, no, i got to get home. I don't want this. I want to get home. And so I told the boys, the guys, y'all stop for a minute. Just, just stop. And I actually apologized to them because I didn't know how this night was going to turn out. And I told them, I said, y'all just pray. Just pray that we get home safely. Because it doesn't look good right now. Hardly anybody on the road, except for maybe once in a while, a truck is coming my way. And I'm praying, please don't hit me. Because if it hits me, I'm going over into the water. Well, we crossed the bridge. And um, you would think, it would be, oh, man, it's great. It got worse. Now, if you've ever been that way, it's the most desolate stretch of Highway 64 you've ever been on. There's nothing there except for swamp on either side. So I can't even pull over. And I had seen a sign coming in a couple of days earlier that said, do not disturb or feed the bears. So I'm thinking if the alligators don't get us, the bears will get us. Somehow we're, we're not. I know some of you biologists will say, well, the bears are hibernating in the winter. Not if you run into them in a truck. They're gonna, you ever seen open season? Uh, if you have kids, you have. Those bears are coming after me. And the worst part of all is my cell phones don't work. I can't call anybody. I'm on this Snow, in the snowstorm, can turn around, can pull over. And finally, I got connection, and the pastor friend, he, he, he began to call every pastor he knew down on that, that stretch of highway and found someone that came to rescue us. The point is this. The fault was not with my boys. The fault was with me. I made that decision. I led them into the situation that could have ended very very badly and as bad as it was it is much worse what we're about to talk about where parents lead their children towards hell 
As bad as that night was, and I'll never forget it, it is worse when parents lead their children towards eternal damnation by the decisions and the choices they make. Our message tonight is our series on the family. And this message is called Keeping Your Kids Out of Hell. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Genesis chapter 19 and starting in verse 12. Let's all stand together for the reading of God's Word. Genesis chapter 19 starting in verse 12. Then the men said to Lot, these are the angels that God had sent to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Then the angels, or the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But I want you to hear this line carefully because I think it represents a lot of us even today. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. <laughs> He's a funny guy he's, he's 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 making jokes and they didn't believe him would you bow your heads in prayer holy spirit we pray tonight in the short time we have together open our eyes to the responsibility i have we have as parents grandparents and even adults if, even if we don't have kids of our own uh, we have responsibilities to lead children in our lives in the right direction and Jesus, we pray tonight, help us to bring children, not just little kids, but even grown children, to a saving knowledge of your gospel before it's too late. Help us, God, to live a life uh, that will become a gospel in itself so that our young people, our children, will come to know you. In Jesus' name we pray, let everyone say, Amen. You may be seated. Before we dive into Genesis 12, 13, and on and on, uh, several questions I want to ask you. The first question is this. If you are a parent or a grandparent or even an adult who may not have children of your own, how are you leading your children? How are you leading those children in your life? Or better way, how have you led those children in your life are you serious about their eternal future do you care about where they're headed in this life and in the life to come are you doing all you can do to lead them to Jesus Christ you see many of us right this moment if you we were truly honest we're simply casually living as if there is no tomorrow you know better, but for some odd reason, something happened, you lost your faith in church or pastors or something somewhere. You're not living with that urgency that you know you should in leading the children in your life. Whether it's five-year-olds or 50 years old, it doesn't matter. You're not leading them to Christ. So my question tonight again is, are you serious about their eternal future? And here's a different question. Do you know Christ as your Savior? I mean, is your eternal future secure? Are you going to heaven or hell? You know, we don't ask that anymore. We have rephrased a lot of questions we used to ask. Are you going to heaven when you die? Or are you going to hell? Are you saved? So as we walk through this message, I hope that you will examine your hearts and your minds and really say, Holy Spirit, no matter what reason I came tonight, maybe it's just church night, maybe it's just to get out of the house, let me not leave this place the way I walked in, 
burn in my heart the desire to see my children and children in general, young or old, come to know Christ as their Savior. So let's begin. As you know, we're studying the life of Abraham and Sarah and their family from the book of Genesis, and we're trying to understand how they made those decisions. It's a series on the family. We started two weekends ago. And tonight we're going to learn how they kept their children out of hell. Now, in order to get the right perspective on this, we have to begin in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 4. Listen to this verse. So Abram, his name hasn't changed yet, departed as the Lord had spoken to him. Now focus on this, this little line right here. And Lot went with him. Now who was Lot? Lot was Abraham's nephew. And as I mentioned in the previous messages, I believe that Lot attached himself to Abraham after his father died. And maybe it was because he needed somebody that he could look up to. Nothing wrong with that. We need to help people who go through a difficult time, and, and so that's, that's perfectly fine. But unlike Abraham, who had a call from God, there is no mention of such a call in Lot's life. Now, this does not mean that Lot wasn't saved. In fact, if you read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, it says, righteous Lot. It means Lot was a believer. But there's a big difference between Abraham and Lot. You see, Lot did not have the same calling on his life. But when he saw his uncle breaking camp, he decided to join the caravan. I'll go with you. I'm going to follow you. So everywhere Abraham went, Lot went with him. And every time God blessed Abraham, Lot managed to get in on the blessing. Lot to me is what I would call a coat hanger. A coat tail hanger. You say, what is a coat tail hanger? This is a person who comes into your life and he or she attaches himself or herself to you. They go where you go, but they're not where you are. Does that make sense? They talk like you talk, but they're only copying you. They may even show some external improvements, but there are no deep internal convictions and values. They, are, they may be saved, but they're not on the same spiritual wavelength with you. They are the proverbial hanging on your coattails. You heard that before? You're hanging on the coattails of your parents. You're hanging on the coattails of your Sunday school teacher, your preacher, your whoever. Now I'm going to tell you this and we're going to move on rapidly. Beware of coattail hangers. They have the potential to get you off course. You have a call from God. You're trying to follow you, but you have this person with you. It's okay to help them. It's okay to encourage them. It's okay to even take, you along, take them along with you, but be careful because they're not thinking the same way you are. And if you're not careful, they will get you off course. And by the way, if crisis comes, you see their true colors by the decisions they make. Amen. Let me ask you tonight before we go further. Do you have a coattail hanger in your life? Do you have that someone? They're just hanging on to you. Pray for them. Encourage them. But don't let them get in the way of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Let me ask you a question. This is more difficult than the first one. Are you a coattail hanger are you the one who is hanging on to someone's faith are you the one who is hanging on to someone's spiritual walk are you the one who is who is going where they're going but you don't have that same passion for lord jesus christ well tonight it's time to let go and you better hang on to him not to that person amen so let's return to our account so both 
Abraham and Lot, uh, they are together all the time and their livestock begin to grow. They, 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 their herd begins to expand and there is conflict between Abraham's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen. So Abraham comes to Lot and says, hey, listen, wait, we're family. There are no sense in fighting with each other. Let, let, I tell you what, why don't you pick the land you want first and I'll take whatever is left over. Why did Abraham do that? And you know, sometimes people think, man, he was such a humble guy. He was such a peace-loving guy. He was such a generous guy. Not true. I think it was much more than that. And the Hebrews chapter 11 verse 9 tells us something about Abraham that I wish I had. Listen to what it says. By faith, Abraham dwelt in the land of promise as if in a foreign country dwelling in tents. For he waited for the city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. What does that mean? Don't misunderstand. It does not mean that Abraham was a nomad. You know what a nomad is? People who just wander. They go from place to place like Bedouins even today. They live in tents. For 10 years, they'll be over here. Next thing you know, the pasture is gone. They'll move somewhere else. I don't believe that's what Abraham was. Not only that, but I don't believe it means that Abraham was an idealist. You know what an idealist is? Someone who is like waiting for that pie in the sky, that perfect city someday beyond the great blue. I don't think so. Let me tell you what it means. It means this. It means that Abraham wanted to be the citizen of a city of which God was the founder and the mayor. It means this. Abraham wanted to build his home and raise his family in a city whose visions and values were made by God. So he was content to live as long as he had to. He said, I'm not going to build a home. I'm going to live in a tent. What it means is this. Abraham refused to submit to the sinful culture around him. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? He's, he, he, the reason he was living in tents is not because, well, I like, the, I like the wandering life. Or, man, I'm looking for that perfect place. No, the reason he was living in tents is because he was saying, I'm waiting for that city whose builder, whose founder, whose mayor is God himself. I am not going to submit to the ungodliness around me. Let me clarify something here. In this life, you and I are going to have to live in cities, towns. I mean, this is life. Uh, you, it doesn't mean that you all need to sell your home and buy you a tent. All right? It doesn't mean that. You'll have to be involved in the world. I'm involved in our community. I'm involved in our city. You may, be ha you may have to get involved in the decisions that are being made. You may have to send your kids to schools and colleges. God is not against that. Yes, sometimes people get so idealistic. You know what they do? They, they move away from the world. They go, I'm just going to move in my little commune. Everybody's just like me. And we, we just, that's creepy people, folks. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> don't, don't, don't. If I hear about y'all moving somewhere out in Texas and you got your little, I'm coming to rescue you, okay? Please don't do that. And they always... Anyways, not only that, it doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean you start living like people used to live 300, 400 years ago. You know who I'm talking about. I love buying their jams. I love buying their, their, their furniture. That's not what you need to do. Folks, I, I'm, I'm being very serious. I'm joking, but the, the point is this. People misunderstand what the Word of God is saying. If that were the case, if we were supposed to live without electricity and light and all that kind of stuff, and hey, listen, Jesus would have never told us, be the salt of the earth and be the light of the world. 
to be the salt and the light, you have to live in the culture. The moment you withdraw from the culture, listen, you stop winning souls. We're not to isolate ourselves from the world, but instead we are to influence the world with the gospel. When Abraham said, I'm, no, I'm going to live in tents, he was not saying, I'm going to be a recluse. This is going to be our little commune. No, what Abraham was saying was this, I refuse to go along with your ways. But there's another category of people. You know who they are? They are those who instead of influencing the world, they get assimilated into the world. They become part of the world. They get sucked into the temptations and the lures of the world. They are one with the world. You can't tell the difference between them and the world. Can I, can I, and I hope I don't hurt your, your feelings. If people at your workplace, in your neighborhood are shocked to find that you are a Christian, you go to church, something is wrong with that. I don't think y'all really heard that one. I'll say it again. If people have to say, oh really, I didn't know you went to church, that should be a slap in the face. Because there should be something different about you. I'm not saying you got to be holy rollers. I'm not saying that you need to be you know, so distinct that people go, man, those are creepy people. No. But there should be something about you that says, no, they are different. Because they walk with God. Can I ask you tonight, before we go any further, which one are you? Which one are you? Which... <laughs> If you were to talk to your family, which one would you say you are? Are you isolated from the world? Are you influencing the world? Or the saddest one, are you assimilated with the world? I don't know. Abraham was not an isolationist. He was an influencer, but I want you to meet this guy right now. We just started looking at him, Lot. Lot was a believer, but he had assimilated into the world. He was assimilating into the world. Now, so listen to what it says in verse 10. And Lot, when Abraham said, pick, he said, he lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan. It reminds me of Genesis 3, 6. Remember when Genesis chapter 3, verse 6? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the, to the eyes. First John chapter 2. And listen to verse 16. Listen to what it says. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. It means you're seeing things and you say, oh, that is, I wish we had that. I wish we could live like that. I wish we could act like that. You're letting your physical, material eyes dictate your spiritual conscience. Lot lifted his eyes and he saw the plain of Jordan. And listen to what, it's, what he saw. It, that it was well watered, listen, it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord. Like the, now I want you, don't miss this. Like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar. The land of Egypt. You know, when that, that title is mentioned there, it's much more than the foliage or the terrain in mind. Uh, what it's talking about is the culture of Egypt. It's not just about the greenery and the lush grass. It's about the culture. What Lot is seeing is what he saw in Egypt when he was following Abraham. He was so impressed. He was so fascinated and so dazzled by the Egyptians. He said, man, if I could, I would love to live over there. And then he looks across the Jordan, uh, the plain of the Jordan. And he says, wow, that reminds me of Egypt. I'll take that one.
And listen to verse 11. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. By the way, what Lot did not realize is that by journeying towards Jordan, he was Xing himself out from God's promise to Abraham. You know, God's promise to Abraham was the land. When it, Lot said, man, that over there, I mean, if you don't mind Abraham, I mean, I love those cities, man. I love, I love um, Sodom. If you don't, if, if, unless you want to, I mean, I, I, you know, and Abraham's like, go for it. But what he didn't realize is in that process, he was Xing himself out of God's provision, God's protection on him. Let me say something here. I've been pastoring for 18 years. This has been my only church, my first church. This is it. And I have seen people time and again choose the greener grass. They see with their physical, material eyes, and they go, ah, that will make me happy. And they say something like this, this can be so much better for our children and for our future. They don't consider where God is and what he's trying to do and what he's trying to teach them and what he's taking. God has no part he hasn't even been mentioned in the decision. Forget about trying to ask his permission. He hasn't even been mentioned in the decision. People make decisions just like that. What they don't realize is in that process, they X themselves out of God's promise of protection and provision. But that's not the worst. The worst is about to come. Our time is short. Listen to verse 12. What did Lot do? And Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain. Altogether, there were five cities, including Sodom and Gomorrah. But guess what he does? The Bible is an amazing book. And he pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. Amazing, isn't it? Somebody wrote a book years ago, Slouching Towards Sodom. He was so impressed with this that even though he went in the cities, he said, can I, can I be a little bit closer to Sodom? Except for one problem. Listen to verse 13. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Now, what was the, what was the problem in Sodom? Later on, do you know Sodom was synonymous with homosexuality? That was the sin of Sodom. Sometimes people say something like this. Don't miss this, okay? They'll say something like this. They'll say, um, homosexuality is a sin like any other sin. People drink, people commit adultery, homosexuality. It's about the same thing. You know, hey, you sin, why are you judging one sin more than the next? What's the big deal? Please listen carefully. It's a big deal to God. You say, how come? Read Romans chapter 1. You know what you'll find in Romans chapter 1? You'll find this, that homosexuality is the last step on the way down. It is the last step before God gives people over to their debased minds to destroy themselves completely. He said, why is that? Why, why would that one thing be so bad to God? I preached on this before. I'm going to say it very quickly because that's not the main focus of our message. You and I are made in the image of God. We are a copy of God. What is an image? Image is a copy. When a man says that he is a woman or a woman says he, she is a man, what we're saying is that the copy is faulty, but much more than that, the original is faulty. Homosexuality is not an attack against people and culture and civilizations. It is an attack on the nature of God. You're saying you're messed up. That's where God says, I don't think so. You see why 
that is the last step on the way down. So what did God do? Listen to Genesis chapter 14. God decides to destroy this city. But by the way, by this time, Lot has become a citizen of Sodom now. Remember, he moved towards Sodom, but now he moved into Sodom. In Genesis chapter 18 and 19, we hear that God himself came down. I believe that's the pre-incarnate Christ, right? He came down with two of his angels, and his, and his purpose was, one, uh, to talk to Abraham about his coming baby and Sarah and to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. What did Abraham do? He pleaded with God. He said, God, if there are 50, would you destroy? If 45, 40, 30, 20, 10, he kept negotiating, he kept pleading for Sodom. Why was he doing that? Because his nephew's in there. Coattail hanger. <laughs> he, he's trying to rescue Lot. What happens? Let me just summarize. The angels go into Sodom. Jesus didn't go into Sodom. Why? Because of the sin. The angels go in. They find Lot. He is sitting by the gates of the city. He recognizes the angel. That's how you know he was actually a child of God. He recognizes them. He invites them. He begs them to stay. He knows who they are. And guess what? In chapter 19, verse 12, uh, before that, the men of the city surround the house. No other way to say it, but they wanted to gang rape. And the angels come out and they strike them with blindness. Now listen to what the angels said to Lot. They said, have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place. There's a finality in it. What was the response? What did the son-in-laws do? Remember we started by reading that passage? The son-in-laws laughed at him. <laughs> You're going to tell us about godliness? You moved in here, buddy. You love this place. So the son-in-laws laughed at him. I believe the daughter -in -law, daughters also laughed at him. How about his sons? Some people say, I don't think he had sons. The angel, I think the angel said that for a reason. His sons, I believe, were too far gone. Who else did he have? Your daughters. Remember he tried to pass his two daughters in? They were virgins. That's why they're not with the son-in-laws. They're different daughters. So he lost, I don't know how many daughters he lost. He lost his sons. And now the two daughters he's got left in the house are the only ones he's got left. So now his wife and two virgin daughters, Lot says, this is all I got. But I want you to see what happens the next day. It's time to get out. <laughs> and while he, what's the word there? Lingered. What is lingering? What is lingering? It's just hanging out. <laughs> Lot did not, I believe one or two things. Again, our time is over. Either he didn't think God was going to do it, or he was too attached to the place to leave it. As he is lingering, the man, the angels, took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. Can you picture that? They just kind of like, boom, dropped it, like, go. I wish I could say then they lived happily ever after. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen that way. Lot began to beg the angels not to make him escape to the mountain. He said, can I, can I just kind of stay here, stay, stay nearby? You see, his heart was still not right. And because he did not go far, what happened next? God began to rain down fire and brimstone from the heavens. It began to destroy the land. I filmed this a couple of years ago. It destroyed the land completely. 
what is left are structures like this, and you can tell there were probably buildings and homes. Nothing left. They burned from the top to the bottom. But something sad happened. His wife, she looked behind him, which means he was still behind her. Man is supposed to lead, right? But he was behind. She looked behind him, and the Bible says she turned into a pillar of salt. I don't know what that means. Maybe she inhaled some fumes. Uh, maybe some fell on her. I, I don't know what that really means. All I know is she died. She didn't make it out. And then the story just gets worse from that because his daughters now tried to get him drunk, sleep with him. They had the Moabites and the, Canaanite and the Ammonites who were constantly a thorn in the side of the people of God. Let me say it again. Many times people make decisions based on their eyesight, based on materialism, things that seem so alluring. See, they want to be Christian and be so worldly that you cannot even recognize them. Word to the wise, you can't do that. That life, that lifestyle doesn't exist. You will go one way or the other. And if you're trying to be like the world, you will go that way. I'm not into legalism. If you know anything about it, I'll fight it. I can't stand it. When you begin to dress people and check this and check that and what they're doing, I don't care for legalism one bit. So this is not about legalism. This is about a heart relationship that says yes to Christ and no to sin. Let me close with this. You want to keep your kids out of hell, not just your kids, but kids in your life, young kids, older kids, stop being a coattail hanger. It's great to have favorite preachers, but if that's all you have, you're a coattail hanger like Lot. Lead them to the city which has foundations. Means let your faith be grounded in the truth in Christ. Do whatever you can to keep them out of Sodom. Do whatever you can to keep them out of sin. Talk to them. As a father, I'll tell you so many times, and my wife as well, we've spent hours and hours talking to our kids. And you sometimes want us like, like, man, I could have been doing so many other things. But this is important. This is way more important. Because that time is not coming back. I can cry tears later on. I did it all I could and I took them in church. No, you, no that, that's, that doesn't cut it. <laughs> that does not cut it. You've got to live the life. Be warned that there will be a fight. So when you start leading your family in the right path, accept, expect a fight. You know what happened in Sodom? The men of the city came and they were ready to fight them. I can tell you as a, as a father, I'm not speaking like a pastor now, as a father, every time I've tried to lead my children in the right path, there's been a fight from the world. The world says, why do you do that? You are so, so harsh and so this. And by the way, my kids, I think they get away with a whole lot. <laughs> I, I think I'm way too lenient on them. I mean, you know our kids. But even that, the world says, that's way too much now. I, I'm willing to endure that. It doesn't matter. I don't really care what people say. Do you? I care what God says. I want to please him. I want not only for me and my wife to finish well, I want all four of my children to finish well. And the last one, stop lingering and negotiating with God. You want to be serious with God? Get serious with God tonight. Amen? Tonight. Are you saved? Are you doing all you can to lead your family, your children? And by the way, children is not just flesh and blood. People in your life, are you doing all you can to lead them to Christ, to keep them out of hell? If not, tonight you need to make some decisions, some hard, 
hard decision. Again, please don't, don't think I'm telling you to go old-fashioned or telling you to go legalistic. or uh, that, that's, that, I can't stand that. What I'm telling you to do is go to Christ. Love him. Draw close to him. Turn away from sin. Would you stand together? And Holy Spirit, I pray tonight, let this message go deep in my heart. Let me be the first to stand in that line and say, God, I need your grace. I need your strength. I need your wisdom. This is not about my way or the highway. This is not about as long as you live under my roof, you'll do this. This is about a life, a genuine life of love and obedience to Christ. Let every one of us walk away from this place. Speaking to your hearts. You want to come and